Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Is my mic on? Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. been almost two and a half years since Paul passed mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that process to us? And um, you've written a lot about it, spoken sure. about it. And um, what can you tell us that'll help us understand what you've been through and how we can help others? Sure. Um, and by the way, as I was driving over here, I was thinking, uh, if statistics serve and my personal experience serves, at least some of you have laid eyes on your spouse for the first time this week. <laughs> exciting. Congrats in advance, everybody. Um, it's true. It's really true. Um, so it's... <laughs> we see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm just going to step back and say, I think part of being in medicine, what I've come across and learned is that over and over and over, you just keep rising to the occasion, whether it's like putting in a central line for your first time as an intern or doing a code discussion with somebody or catching a baby when you're a student or, you know, whatever you're going to do next week, literally. Um, you just have to keep rising to the occasion. And I feel like what happened with me and Paul when Paul was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer as a senior resident uh, in neurosurgery, as a chief resident, um, and then certainly with writing this book and with what's happened to me since he died, sort of doing this big book tour and advocating for a better end of life care and sort of being in these, talking to you, being in all these unusual situations that I wouldn't have quite anticipated. Um, you just rise to the occasion. And I'm sure, you know, if you ask anybody who's a mentor to you or somebody you admire, how did you get to be where you are today? How did you get to be the dean? Whatever it might be, it's always something unexpected. And it's always like, you know, you wend your way through your life in these unexpected ways, even when you're on a track as seemingly straight as medicine um, or the health professions. So um, that's like my first reflection, I think. Um, and then I uh, obviously have reflected a lot on the patient-provider, patient-physician relationship, too, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about that. Sure, sure. You and Paul met in medical school, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Can you describe that to us, how you met? Sure. Um, so uh, we were first-year students, and he fell in love with me straight away. And I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh, there's that super smart kid in our class. and. Um, and then slowly but surely over the course of a few weeks, I realized Paul was really funny. Um, he had, on his medical student ID, when he stepped up to get the ID photo, he actually put on a fake mustache in the ID photo, which is like sort of crazy. And he'd been a comedy writer in college, and I think he was a little nervous that medicine was gonna like strip him of something to do with his real self, um, which is a you know um, looming specter of something. And, uh, so he put on this mustache, and then uh, three years later, he's applying to be a, a resident in neurosurgery, and it's like on the class face sheet, and all the neurosurgery attendings are looking at this photo of Paul with the fake mustache. But, <laughs> uh, but he was really interesting, funny person, and he um, like really brought his full self to everything, including medical school and um, being a physician. So he was really lovable in a lot of ways, and he, uh, he was just a cool guy. And um, we, you mentioned before, uh, I mean, the book talks a lot about the doctor-patient relationship. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, can you give us an overview of your experiences here? What, mm -hmm. what went well and what, um, what should we do better? And particularly yeah. for students coming into this for the first time, what are the important things for them to keep in mind? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I'll just talk about the experience of being a patient first. And, and caregiver. Um, so one kind of really interesting thing was as a patient and as a caregiver, I didn't analyze a lot like how the providers were doing. I wasn't like, well, this person must be having a rough day. So that's why that went this particular way that I didn't love. Um, you're so vulnerable when you're a patient and you're so um, out of your depth. Even as healthcare providers, we felt that way a lot. Um, so, uh, that was just sort of like an interesting thing to notice that even as a healthcare provider, I was so desperate for people to um, empathize or listen. Uh, and I 
wasn't so much thinking about, um, uh, Paul talked about like when you're a provider and you're going through your day, you sort of have this ticking clock in the back of your mind and all these tasks on your to-do list and what time am I gonna get home and what's going on with my 10 other patients. And um, when you're the patient, you really are feeling like you've been waiting maybe weeks and weeks for this encounter and you and your spouse are gonna go home and dissect every single thing that the physician said and it's just so weighted and so meaningful and you really remember what is said. So. Um, no pressure, but <laughs> that's like what it's like on the other side. Um, <clears throat> and I certainly remember, um, <clears throat> I guess a couple of things. Paul had a really wonderful nurse practitioner in um, thoracic oncology and a really spectacular oncologist. For people who've read the book, you can see how engaged she was in what was really important to Paul in his life and the big challenge of matching his healthcare and his treatments to what he actually wanted in his life. And that ranged from everything from tailoring his chemo so he wouldn't get peripheral neuropathy and he could still operate, to prescribing a stimulant off-label so that he could write despite the fatigue of progressive cancer. Um, but I remember this moment with the nurse practitioner where it was the second, it was the major time that Paul's cancer had progressed um, despite the targeted therapy. So, He's, he has his last day as a surgeon, and then he's like realizing that um, it's almost like a new devastation when your cancer progresses. Um, and she came into the room and said, have you seen your scan? And he was like, yeah, I looked at my scan. And she looked him in the eye and said, I really wanted you to be the guy on Tarsiva for seven years, and you're not that guy, and I'm really sorry. And it was so like in it, like she really was in it. and it. I still remember it. I still remember that feeling of feeling really allied with her. Um, and just what an important thing that freezing was and like her um, immersion in what was happening. Um, and you can't do that every day with every patient. You just can't. Um, and you just may not feel that way with every patient. But as you go through school and you're learning like various empathetic statements or whatever else it might be that you can bring to your encounters, that stuff really matters. Like there's real data on patient adherence is related to how much they feel allied with you as their provider. I mean, it's really fascinating. Like you are the medicine in a lot of cases. Um, so that was one thing. And then uh, I'll tell you another secret sort of. Um, so there was a moment where Paul was admitted um, with complications of chemotherapy and the resident who was taking care of him uh, didn't add, didn't add um, Erlotinib or Tarsiva, the targeted chemo pill to his med list um, in the hospital because his LFTs were kind of high and um, Paul was like, well, it's been like that for months and I really get severe pain when I am in withdrawal from this medication and so please can you put it on my list and if you don't do it by 5 a.m., it's gonna take till 2 p.m. because everybody has to round and I know how this all works and like, has to come up from the pharmacy. And the, um, the resident wasn't really listening to, um, to what he was saying and it was really frustrating and isolating. Um, and then they didn't end up ordering it and I had the medication in my purse. I had like this um, pill container of, you know, oxycodone and, naproxen and Tarsiva and all these things and it's like, we called it the fun kit and we used to, <laughs> we used to joke it was worth like $1,500 on the streets of wherever. Um, and, um, but you know, it's like we were, we had all that stuff on us and we were managing his treatments all the time and he ended up taking it um, in the hospital, like out of my purse. It's like really, that was pretty crazy. And I think when you're, you know, if I had been the inpatient student or resident or attending and the patient on my service took their, ho their home med, their home medication without it being on the list that I had ordered, I would have been like, this is a patient safety issue. I feel really slighted. Like, this is, this is not how you do it. Um, and it's not really how you do it. Uh, but it was a really pivotal moment for me in thinking, you know, a hospital is not a prison and the people in there are infantilized in all these different ways, they're naked, you know, you don't always know your patient's name, like, literally, and I think um, that moment for me was like, 
when you're the patient and you're the patient's family, like you do what you need to do and that's your body and you're the one who knows your body and you're making your own choices as an informed agent. Um, and I just thought that was really like striking and a real kind of internal conflict for me that I was surprised by. Um, yeah, so that, those are some sure. initial thoughts. Great, great. Paul writes uh, in the book about uh, the death by suicide of a dear friend, mm -hmm. Jeff, a resident who um, died after a severe complication in one of his patients. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've been talking a lot here about and nationally is about physician wellness mm -hmm. and healthcare provider wellness and how we can promote that and mm -hmm. how we as colleagues and friends um, can um, work together to be healthier and have better mental health than traditionally our profession yeah. has had. What, um, you've thought a lot about this. What type of advice can you give for, mm -hmm. uh, for our incoming students? Oh yeah, I, I think about this a lot. And there's data that med students have higher quality of life and higher resilience than their peers. Um, I'm assuming it's like the same for PA and other health profession students. Like to get to this moment in your life, you have to have unbelievable grit already. Um, and then uh, your, um, your perceived quality of life like plummets sometime pretty soon based on the stresses that you're under and what you're witnessing and um, how hard things get. And um, it can be really hard to keep a grasp on your um, mental health and uh, you know, your, the balance in your life. And I guess I have two kind of big thoughts about it. One is, or I guess it comes from two different places, right? One is personal resilience and well-being and wellness. And then the other one is the system that we're all a part of. And it's super, I think the, the system part is a really big deal. Um, and Stanford is actually turning into a national leader thinking about um, health professional burnout. And Tate Shanafelt, who I'm sort of in love with, I should probably shouldn't say it's like not that professional to say I'm in love with Tate Shanafelt, but in a professional sense. I'm in love with Atul Gawande too, I'm sure half of you guys are. It's like there's these people who are really thinking authentically about what's happening in medical culture and in our profession, and Tate Shanafelt's one of them, and he's been recruited um, from Mayo to Stanford to think about physician burnout. And, um, and there's these system factors, like things like um, loss of autonomy or unrealistic workload or inefficiency um, that really contribute to our well-being and the Stanford's really thinking about it and the AAMC that oversees medical schools and the ACGME that oversees residencies are recognizing this sort of epidemic of burnout among health professionals. And so the main message I would have is if you feel burned out or if you feel depressed or anxious or whatever, it's not necessarily, in fact I would say it's not, uh, that there's something wrong with you. Um, it's kind of a greater system issue too and something we all are thinking about how to support each other. Um, and, and that's really exciting and I think um, there used to be a real stigma about seeking help for um, mental illness or stress and this idea that it's gonna affect your medical license. Like they surveyed s surgeons who'd had suicidal ideation and half of them had not wanted to seek help um, for fear it would affect their license. That's a huge deal and I think that's changing a great deal and especially at a school like Stanford where like we can sit with the dean and talk about this issue. Like that's fantastic and amazing. So um, uh, certainly don't be afraid to um, reach out for resources and I know that um, some of your professors talked about wellness um, during orientation and for me it's been uh, sleep, uh, exercise is a huge one. And then there's data on mindfulness meditation now too. The Surgeon General under Obama talked a lot about mindfulness and like did mindfulness meditation in schools with people. Um, there's an app called Headspace that I don't own stock in, but I should. That's really excellent for um, meditation. Um, and then social connection being the other big one, maintaining your relationships. So uh, I think that stuff really matters and I think your leadership will make a difference in the burnout question. Um, uh, but I think it's really, important that we're talking about it. Absolutely. Paul, um, of course, had background in humanities as mm -hmm. well as in science, neuroscience, neurosurgery. Um, how do you think that, and he was an extraordinarily eloquent writer, mm -hmm. how did that shape him as a person and what, mm -hmm. um, 
do our students, can our students learn from um, maintaining interests outside yeah. of medicine? Because he clearly was an avid reader and writer, um, yeah. you know, throughout his life. And um, how did maintaining that influence him, influence you uh, through, through your endeavors in those areas? And what can our students learn from yeah. that? Um, yeah, so, um, uh, so Paul came to medicine thinking that he never would have done it and um, had thought he would be an English professor or a philosophy professor and then became a neurosurgeon through this real interest in what makes us human and how do we conceive of suffering and what it means to you know, be an agent but live in a physical body and thinking of mortality as sort of a really interesting intellectual, philosophical problem to get your head around, but then wanting to witness um, people facing their mortality in, you know, in a really direct way. And then uh, he ended up needing to do that himself earlier than expected. Um, and there was this interesting moment that I've talked about in some other settings, but uh, Paul sort of hadn't read a decent book um, as a neurosurgery resident for a while, and he'd you know, been studying anatomy textbooks and surgical atlases and stuff, um, but then had this, you know, had been getting more and more ill and suddenly found out the results of this chest x-ray that had nodules throughout it and was admitted to Stanford Hospital for expedited workup of what was causing these symptoms. And, um, you know, the differential diagnosis was pretty small and maybe it was disseminated tuberculosis and probably it was metastatic cancer and we were packing to come to the hospital to be direct admitted. Um, and he packed books in this little duffel bag that we brought. He packed um, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis and a novel called uh, uh, Cancer Ward by Solzhenitsyn and Being in Time by Heidegger, which is um, uh, about phenomenology. It's about um, a lot about inhabiting a physical body. Um, and that was a really interesting moment for me. Um, and Paul talks in the book, too, about, he says something like, um, this is paraphrased a little bit, uh, trying, to, um, uh, trying to grapple with existential distress through um, you know, medical knowledge and statistics is like trying to quench a thirst with salty water. You just can't do it. And so I think thinking about the human condition through these other fields, whether it's um, uh, you know, the humanities or literature or philosophy, or certainly you'll all come across bioethics when you're thinking about um, things like whether to withdraw life support on one of your patients. Like you'll see that all really quickly. And those um, other disciplines' ability to characterize the human condition and help us understand what we're doing and helping us cope with what we're doing as we face it every day, uh, I think is really important and helpful. Um, uh, and I was going to say one other thing. Uh, darn, I can't remember. Shoot, I can't remember. It's OK. It's OK. Yeah. If I think of it, I'll tell you. So Katie's three Katie's now. three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. She's like 60% potty trained. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's been wonderful having her. Hasn't? Oh yeah, and, yeah, it's the yeah, best. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, as you as you relate the the last part of the book, of course, the last paragraph mm -hmm. is is directed towards Katie. And what what types of things do you plan to mm -hmm. do with her as she's growing up um, to continue, you know, or build that connection um, mm -hmm. because she was clearly such an important part um, in your life and. Uh, it continues to be in your life, mm -hmm. but in Paul's life. To build the connection with Paul? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm really happy that he wrote this book because he did it in part for her. Paul didn't leave like a series of other letters or messages for Katie. Like this is it and this is what he conceived of leaving for her too. Um, <clears throat> I recently made Katie a picture book of Paul, like about Paul, because she's super into Elmo and Peppa Pig and Curious George, like she really understands these characters to a great depth. And so <laughs> I was like, well, why don't I make her a book about Paul with pictures of him growing up and pictures of him as a physician and um, it has pictures of his grave site actually, because we go there and she doesn't, certainly doesn't have a concept of what a grave is. Um, she just knows she might see a bunny when we're there or whatever, but um, you know, she's sort of gonna grow up into this knowledge about who her dad was and hopefully 
where she came from and a sense of him. And at the same time, it's important for me to not have him be canonized as this like unattainable, perfect person because he wasn't, first of all, and because also I think in a way that's not even fair to him and certainly not fair to her. So I'm trying to figure out how to like <laughs> share him with her in a kind of really authentic way. And if anybody here actually, if anybody here has experience growing up trying to learn about a parent who died or a grandparent or somebody where you are conceiving of a relationship you have but you're, you don't know the person, I'd, like, I'd really love any advice on it because I think about it a lot, how to do that um, well. And I think obviously in the book, Paul writes directly to her at the end and says, I love you, essentially. And then he talks the whole time about striving. And um, he talks about the asymptote toward which you're ceaselessly striving. You can't be perfect, but you sort of are obligated to keep trying, especially in medicine. And I think that's a good message for a kid too, right? Like, I love you and you need to try hard. I think that's, that's like <laughs> it, basically. <laughs> yeah. It's a great message for all of us. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So there are a lot of challenges in medicine today. We've got uh, the EMR that takes us away yeah. from our patients. We've got um, the increasing, increasing complexities just of delivering care. Um, and yet what really comes across uh, from the book is, is this notion mm -hmm. that it is a calling, that it's not a job. And um, as Paul wrote, uh, if you're doing it as a job, you know, you're crazy because there are plenty of other jobs that you can make making more money, spending less hours. And what do you think is special about the calling? What's what's been special for you, your physician? Mm -hmm. uh, what was special to Paul about yeah. about the calling? And what can our students learn about that? Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I think medicine is just the best. I um, I remember being a med student. Paul talks about when he's uh, he's writing about anatomy lab uh, in the memoir, and he says, you know, I went to cocktail parties as a med student, and I kept trying to emphasize the macabre of what I was doing because I wanted to prove that I was kind of still normal, <laughs> and I still like thought this stuff was actually weird that I was doing. Um, and he actually wrote that essay as a second-year med student um, as part of this intro to anatomy lab that was happening for the first years and then added it to the book later. Um, but I remember as a med student thinking like, wow, I'm seeing so much more than a bunch of other people who are in the same age bracket. Um, my sister is a lifestyle blogger um, and a writer. And I was like, she has this perfect life and she still has this perfect life on Facebook and Instagram and it's not totally perfect behind the scenes, but it's like we see a lot of stuff that not a lot of people our age see. And I was seeing things that my twin sister wasn't ever gonna see um, in the same way, and it's very intense. Um, but I feel like you really get a front row seat to the human condition, and it's very interesting and compelling and meaningful, I think. Um, and then I think, um, I don't know, I think you know everybody in their med school application essay essentially distilled or um, beflowered the idea of like, I, I like science and I want to help people. That's like what everybody said, right? And I think and you tried to like be a little creative in the way you said it. And, um, but it's really true. I mean, like if you like science and you want to help people, like you are in the right place. It's so interesting and fascinating. And I think you get to use your brain in every single domain, you know? I mean, you're Paul as a neurosurgeon who had studied all these various things, like he's putting them all to use and thinking about um, you know, the moral component of what he's doing and the really scientific technical component of what he's doing and then how to communicate to another person, um, especially one who doesn't have any of the knowledge but really needs to grasp the particulars and the um, science, you know, um, through your words. I think it's so fascinating. Um, and I sort of think, I don't know, for me personally, I, I don't know, maybe I'd be an astronaut, but I don't think there's anything else I would choose other than this. And, um, and the same thing, I haven't felt like that every day. I mean, I, it makes you really tired and these various other things, but I think uh, it's a really exciting, meaningful thing to do. Empathy is a theme mm -hmm. in the book, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's um, an important theme for all of us in our lives, in our professions as physicians. Mm -hmm. 
What has been most important for you mm -hmm. as a physician, um, as Paul's wife, uh, before and during his illness, mm -hmm. uh, and now in, in the healing process mm -hmm. after uh, his death? What, mm -hmm. Can you describe to us what your definition, your meaning of empathy mm -hmm. is, and, and um, what can we all learn from that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess for me, <coughs> excuse me, guys, um, a couple of things are kind of coming to mind. Um, so I don't know. I feel like empathy to me, the, key, the first key is really trying to think about what the other person is experiencing. And sometimes that actually really shapes the words you use. Like if you can get your head into what somebody else might be feeling, um, oftentimes it'll help you start out the conversation. And a lot of the time that can be purely just by naming what's happening and sitting there. Or naming the look on somebody's face and then just sitting there saying, I see it's really bringing tears to your eyes and just sitting there. And I think um, uh, learning to sit there and tolerate your own discomfort and give space for somebody else's feelings um, which in a clinical encounter is really important and also doesn't even take that long um, and may actually speed up the visit because the communication like gets to where it needs to be quickly um, uh, is really important. And then I think there's something to um, naming things or saying things out loud. And that's been true for me in my personal relationships and in what happened with Paul. Um, right after Paul got diagnosed, we were on G1 uh, in uh, Stanford Hospital, and uh, he said, I want you to get remarried after I die. And that was like one of the first, I think he writes it in the book, but it was one of the first things he said, and it was really, is that me? I don't feel like it's me. I don't want to like rupture our eardrums. Um, tympanic membrane. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think Paul saying that, really acknowledged like what was actually happening. He sort of said, after I die, and then he said, I want you to remarry. He's sort of saying all these things in this one sentence of like, I'm going to acknowledge what's happening. I'm going to demonstrate how much I care about you. Like, I'm going to think immediately about what effect this is going to have on you. And I think I interact a lot of, with a lot of people who've been in a tough situation, whether it's like in a bookstore, um, talking about Paul's book, or people who email me because their spouse died or just whatever. Um, and I think I'm better able to communicate about it because I'm willing to sort of just say it and say what's happening. And I think a lot of times we skirt around what's actually happening with other people because we're afraid we're going to make them more sad or we're afraid it's going to be awkward or we're going to make them cry or we're not going to say the perfect thing. And I think that kind of stuff actually happens in the hospital walls too where we can be really afraid to be really straightforward with a patient about what's happening with their body. Um, and I think people need that kind of information as long as it's coming like from you as a human being. You know, um, That can go a really long way. And um, there's so much you can accomplish just by like mirroring what somebody else is looking like or feeling. Um, and I think um, one of the things I really liked about Being Mortal by Atul Gawande is when he's talking about shadowing Susan Block, who's a palliative care doctor in Boston. And he says something really cool. He's like, I realized that running a family meeting in the ICU and talking through the ethical choices of how to take care of a critically ill patient at a real juncture, he said I th that's just as um, you know, major a technical skill as uh, performing a surgery. And I thought it was a real validation of a real thing, which is like the flip side of empathy is, or this idea of empathy in healthcare is, you know, just because you're a nice person and you're feeling it very deeply doesn't actually mean you always know what to say. And so when you're doing these trainings in med school of like working with a standardized patient or learning the language um, to be using, like that stuff is a real tool in your tool belt um, that's worth practicing and using. And, um, I practiced medicine for a while at Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the big, um, like well-regarded integrated health systems in the Bay Area and elsewhere on the West Coast mostly. Um, and we got this data on our patient satisfaction. And um, they were like, if you can make your patient satisfaction scores 20 points higher if 
if you use the sentence, so how is this affecting your day to day? And it was like, for a patient to hear you ask that was like, aha, like that's so, thank you for asking me that. And then meanwhile, it can help you tailor your care to what the patient actually truly wants, which is sort of the only thing that matters. So um, anyway, I think that stuff is really, um, really important. Curious what your story would be. Thank oh, you. thanks for asking. Um, I don't totally know. I really dislike writing, actually. I just like <laughs> <laughs> And Paul didn't, and so I have this sort of unattainable. Hey, can we check thing. the microphone? Or I'll just, I think it Thank you very much. Um, and, but I've since met a lot of writers through this process of working on Paul's book and learned that most writers hate writing. And if you talk to most scientists, they hate writing grants. It's like, I don't think anybody <laughs> likes writing. Um, so I don't know. I, I have been doing a lot of speaking at medical conferences and elsewhere. There was a university in Utah that all their first year students read Paul's book. So I was there yesterday, like doing this convocation thing for them. And, all of this stuff, and today, too, is like, I can't believe that Paul's not here doing it, because he would have done such a masterful job, and it's like, he would have just been so excited that I'm here and he would to be here. Um, so right now, I'm really enjoying the speaking piece of it, and some of it, I go to medical conferences and say some of the types of things I'm saying today, and in a way, it's like any patient could go there and say this stuff, but it's interesting to engage like as a healthcare professional with other healthcare professionals talking about these ideas of what we're actually doing for people and what's helpful and what's not. Um, yeah, and then it's like, I don't know, I'm dating somebody now, which is really exciting and interesting and also like one of those things where it's like you just never know what your life is going to look like, you know, like five years ago, Paul and I were there and our careers were blossoming in this way and, you know, maybe we we're going to move from the Bay Area, maybe we weren't and now I'm a single mom and doing this thing, and it's like, I think part of the appeal to me of medicine was the fact that, like, if you get on the track and you do a good job, you can stay on the track and keep going. So you just, like, you know you have to work really hard, but it's like your path is reasonably predictable in your career. And that's true to some degree, and it is a lot. I mean, it kind of is true. But then at the same time, like, there's all these upheavals in our lives, personal or professional or whatever, and I think Paul's illness um, the pain of facing uncertainty about his life expectancy and what was going to happen with his health, I sort of learned to tolerate uncertainty um, in a way that I hadn't before to that point because we just had to. And so I sort of feel that way right now. I'm sort of like a little uncertain about, you know, am I really an academic? I don't know. Like, what's happening? So um, I'll, I'll, that remains to be seen, I think. Um, and I also do think for me professionally, the way we think about end-of-life care um, uh, in modern medicine with all the technology we have and the fact of the battle metaphor of like even in advanced disease, like we're going to fight it, we're going to beat it. Um, like how do you help patients and how do we come to terms with the fact that, you know, aging and dying, um, again, as Atul Gawande wrote about so eloquently in Being Mortal, aging and dying are not medical problems. They're like problems of having a human mortal body and participating in the human condition. So I think that's a real question of how we do that ethically and how we help our patients understand what's possible and what's not and what the trade-offs are. And I think end-of-life care, um, you know, people talk a lot about um, healthcare costs and, um, you know, healthcare costs and being careful about healthcare resources and stewards of the 18% of the GDP that we spend on what we do. And I think end-of-life care is somewhere where the business case for improving care and the moral case for improving care line up. Um, so I am really excited to be in that space and thinking about um, how we talk about that and what we do. So, um, And meanwhile, I never thought I would be speaking so publicly about such personal stuff um, at all. Um, but you know, thinking about burnout, I have done a number of talks about burnout and talked about how I had an episode of depression in residency and how I got through that and um, how I was really anxious. I was the only person that had ever happened to and it was gonna ruin my career. And you know, part of, part of going through an episode of depression or severe anxiety or whatever is like you have these catastrophic <coughs> thoughts. And, um, uh, and then I made it through that and feel more resilient as a result and felt more prepared for Paul's illness as a result in a way. So. Um, but like who, at the time, if you told me 10 years ago that I was going to sit in front of a dean, the dean of Stanford Medicine and talk about that, I 
never would have believed it. So, um, so I don't know. I think uh, that rising to the occasion thing is like happening all the time. Thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, I think one of my uh, favorite parts about the book uh, was um, how Paul said, had I been more religious in my youth, I would have become a pastor, for it was the pastoral aspect that I saw, the pastoral role. And um, so at the time when the book came out, I was working in a neurosurgery lab up at UCSF. Um, and you know, personally, I'm interested in neurosurgery and, you know, also like hoping to become a pastor um, in the future. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, during the course of Paul's illness, how um, his faith was, was both challenged and how that may have changed uh, his perspective um, of addressing his patients with that sort of pastoral approach. Sure. Um, I love it. And I love you for having that line on the tip of your tongue. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll talk specifically about religion maybe. And um, uh, so Paul, it was interesting because Paul's <coughs> religious um, like faith was not made greater or stronger by the fact of going through this serious illness. And I think as you witness in your family or patients, a lot of people like swing one way or the other. And um, their faith is really challenged or their faith becomes stronger or whatever during the time that they're sick. And um, the chaplaincy service at Stanford Hospital is amazing and has this huge resource for patients. And I think it gives, for Paul's parents, when Paul was sick, the chaplains at Stanford Hospital were incredibly helpful. Who They were there in real time, like when Paul was having his first CT, when Paul, during the day Paul died, like very helpful. So um, be unafraid to call them for your patients anytime you think somebody might need a chaplain. Um, and uh, um, so anyway, I'm basically an atheist, maybe an agnostic since Paul's illness, which is sort of, that's a sort of like a big hump to get over itself, I think. But um, Paul definitely would have called himself a Christian at the time that he died. Um, and uh, um, but was an atheist at various points in his life. And it's funny because people who are neuroscientists or atheists or whatever come up to me and say, like, this guy gets me. Like, I'm, he, I, I feel the same as he does. And people with a really strong religious faith come up to me and say, like, this guy gets me. I feel the same as he does. <laughs> and I think it's, you know, Paul's not trying to change anybody's mind in the book. He's talking authentically about a struggle that he went through in his life with faith. And I think a bunch of people are doing that. Um, and so that's kind of a nice aspect to see. Um, but anyway, for him, it was uh, sort of a helpful, I don't know, it wasn't even premeditated. It's just sort of he was raised in this faith tradition, and then he found his way back to it. Actually, as a med student, it's sort of interesting. Um, and oh, I was going to say one other thing about it. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I'm not sure Paul had a really strong conception of what would happen to him or his soul or whatever after he died. I think that wasn't even a big part of it for him. Um, but I think it was more specifically impacted the way he thought about service and the way he thought about um, like the values in his life, including things like striving and um, thinking about suffering or thinking about forgiveness and redemption. I don't know, he, the concepts in his faith were really important to him. And then I think it sort of reflected back into for him what it meant to live a good life. And I think, um, I don't really like when people talk about the good death. I think it's like, I, I think when people say he had a bad death or he didn't die well or whatever, I think people know what, they're meaning something. And in a medical context, oftentimes they mean somebody, um, you know, received medical care that was more aggressive than they would have wanted or opted for. But I think um, the good death is kind of a weird phrase. I don't think anybody wants to die. But I think insofar as there's such a thing as, um, you know, dying well or the good death. I think some of it has to do with feeling like you led a good life and feeling happy with the choices that you made. And I think um, that was a piece of what I think helped Paul cope with the fact that he was dying, was um, having lived a life that he wanted to live. So um, anyway, thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Kevin. Um, I wanted to ask, 
Did your conception of happiness in your life and where you find it evolve mm -hmm. over the course of Paul's illness? And if so, do you think that it's fundamental within the human condition for a disease to do that? Mm -hmm. That's an awesome question. So um, uh, I think the answer to your first question is yes. Um, the, so Paul talked about how in his like, college application essay, he argued that happiness is not the point of life. And I don't know where that essay is, but I would really love to read it. And I think um, there's, there's been a number of essays written about this, or you know, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, talks about this. And um, uh, I think um, there's a difference somewhat between happiness and meaning. And, for me, this is epitomized somewhat in the conversation Paul and I had deciding to have Katie, where um, I was really worried about what it mean for him knowing that he was dying and having a child. And I said, <coughs> you know, I'm worried that um, having to say goodbye to a child will make dying more painful for you, certainly. And he said, wouldn't it be great if it did? And sort of the idea of oftentimes the most meaningful things involve some degree of um, uh, suffering or pain and I think you know nobody decides to have a child because they think it's going to be easy um, and there's a study where it's like parents are actually less happy than, than um, people who don't have children but they also many of them feel a great degree of meaning and I think travel is kind of like that and going to medical school is kind of like that it's like it doesn't necessarily make you happy all the time but it deepens your experience of your life and so I think, I used to think, you know, I want to be happy all the time, or I want to raise a happy kid. And now I'm sort of like, I really want to have meaning in my life, and I really want to raise a resilient kid. And I think those are kind of different. And um, for me, that was illuminated somewhat by um, Paul's illness, or at least through discussions that came around it, um, like the one I just mentioned. Um, but I'm not sure you have to have an illness yourself to feel that. I certainly think like you can, I think engaging in some aspect of pain in our lives, and I think we become real witnesses to that in the health professions or, but whether it's like helping a friend through something or um, you know, just going through a really hard thing in a relationship or whatever, I think facing up to those really tough moments in life very authentically and grappling with what they are. And Viktor Frankl talked about how, you know, life, a meaningful life comes from a couple different places from across people. He said three different things. He said um, vocation or work, relationships, and then persevering through difficulty. That like persevering through difficulty was its own meaningful thing in addition to vocation and relationships. Um, so I don't know, those things have like turned out to be true for me and I think uh, it sort of makes me happy because I'm like, well, <laughs> life is guaranteed to be full of pain and hardship and so if that's part of meaning and that's part of like what makes you happy, then like, yay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I, I do feel like my own connections with other people have also deepened as a result of Paul's illness um, in part because my conversations or what people talk about with me or what I'm willing to talk about with other people has, in, has become deeper. Um, a lot of people tell me about their marriage strife now that they know Paul and I had that. And, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'll let you Hi. <laughs> Is this okay? Someone's like, I'm Carly, I'm a PA student, and you mentioned and we read in the book that Paul had an interaction with a beloved nurse practitioner during his treatment journey, and so I was wondering if you could speak to what aspects of that interaction were great, and also maybe how you interact in your professional career with advanced practice providers. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, totally. So, um, uh, I'll just say right off, I, so I'm an attending in Stanford Express Care, which is part of the um, uh, primary care section at Stanford over in the Hoover building. So hopefully, we don't have students as much as I would want, but 
um, hopefully some of you guys can come over to Express Care. It's outpatient urgent care, so um, in between primary care office and the emergency room. Uh, and our clinic is made up of MDs and NPs and PAs um, as colleagues with each other. And uh, there's some things that I notice the PAs, like I rely on the PAs a lot actually for um, office procedure skills. And so, and then we troubleshoot tough cases together. And I work directly alongside um, advanced practice um, providers or APPs in my clinic and love it. And we actually have NP students and PA students who come over there. So um, uh, anyway, for what it's worth, there are our colleagues at Stanford. Um, and uh, then I also think I'm a primary care person. Um, and even though I'm doing urgent care, my real love is primary care and thinking about how to make primary care as robust and um, well functioning and respected uh, in the US as it is in some other um, uh, OED countries and whatever across the world. And um, I think that NPs and PAs have a huge role uh, in primary care and the provider shortage and capacity. And there's a lot of politics and policy around that that really matter at the state level. And I think um, that stuff is super important. But um, thanks for being our colleagues in education and practice here. Um, and the main uh, APP that we interacted with for Paul was the NP in uh, oncology. And then we also interacted with uh, a bunch of physical therapists um, and a ton of nurses, obviously, especially on the inpatient side. And that was really fun to see, um, like when you're an inpatient, how much your bedside nurse matters to you. Um, and then how much the physical therapists like tailored what Paul was needing. Um, and I like really loved Stanford Healthcare. Like I feel like I, I feel really proud to work in this system, but I feel really grateful to have been a patient in the system because um, overall it was amazing. So um, uh, anyway, that, that NP was spectacular. She was the one who saw us a lot of the time initially for the visit. So Paul's um, oncologist, she would usually do the beginning portion of the visit and then go powwow with Paul's oncologist and then they would both come in toward the end. Um, and I felt like she, to me, she was like as vital as the oncologist. They really were a functioning unit uh, in my mind. And when the oncologist was out of town, oftentimes we would only see Allison, her name's Allison. Um, and she had a baby that, during the time that Paul was sick and then the very last oncology we, visit we had, which was on a Thursday and Paul died the following Monday, we were in, um, the thoracic onc clinic talking about um, like how we would set up hospice and whether he could still do a clinical trial. And she was the one who came in and told him that he had brain mets and leptomeningeal disease. And um, she had just come off maternity leave. And as soon as she walked in, I was like, Allison's here. This is so fantastic. Like, and she, it was just so fantastic that she was the one who was there to tell him. And um, he had actually looked at the scan himself and didn't see the brain mets and then made a joke that he was like, I can't tell whether I'm more sad that I have brain mets or that I didn't see them on my own <laughs> MRI. <laughs> and I think in a way he was like, I'm really sick. Like I, I didn't see these subtle mets on my, um, in, the, in my MRI. Um, yeah. You have a last question? Uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming and uh, speaking with us. Um, I don't remember the exact uh, quote in the book, but there comes a time where Paul is meeting uh, with his, with his uh, oncologist, mm -hmm. and she says, it's okay if you let me be the doctor. And I remember reading that and thinking, yes, like, let her do that. Focus on, you know, other more important things like your family. And then I mm -hmm. thought about it a little bit more, and I was like, wait, but that's like being stripped of a piece of your identity. Mm -hmm. And that's the push and pull that goes back and forth in the book. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could uh, address your experience as a healthcare provider and how that felt for you. Oh yeah, sure. Um, you guys have such insightful questions. Um, and you mean like the push and pull between like me being Paul's wife and then also being a physician at the same time? Yeah, like that? You know, uh, you oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to picture, like, I'm trying to remember like what it felt like. Um, I think that transition was a little easier for me. 
um, I think I, I did feel really dependent on Paul's healthcare providers. I mean, somewhat. I think we led them because we knew that we really needed and wanted them to know what was important to us. So like on the day that Paul died and there was this big decision about whether he would be intubated and go on a ventilator or not, I felt like a real advocate for, for giving the healthcare team permission to like know it was okay not to do that because there's this sort of prevailing um, cultural thing about um, being really aggressive or assuming maybe that's what your patient, it's, it's a big question. So I felt like a real advocate for that. Um, but I also felt just so emotionally dependent on them, and Paul did too, especially for a young and male neurosurgeon, like the amount in which he, despite pushing, was really emotional, de emotionally dependent on the oncologist especially. It was really striking, and um, uh, yeah, so I think I didn't, I think I was like really anxious to hear what they would say and really glad. I remember his oncologist used to say things like, how's the new pain medication working out for you guys? And she wouldn't say like, how's the new pain medication working out for Paul? It was like, how's it working out for you guys? And um, so I just felt really like I was part of the team, but, but as his partner, which really mattered to me. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. Uh, that's like the tip of what I can remember right now. Lucy, thank you for your courage, for, me. for your wisdom, for being here with us. And we're so yeah. honored that you're a part of our community. Thanks. And we look forward to having other occasions where we can interact and learn from you. And also from all of us, you're such a valued and treasured member of our community. And thank we're you. here for you as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for thank saying you. that. Thanks for having me. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.